So I have this sort of vision of where the human workplace is scattered both in space and, and, and in time. And for a single career, it's not merely a matter of changing your career every couple of years. It's a matter of actually changing your point of attention on smaller time scales. Hello, I'm John Morvick with Education Futures. I'm joined by phone today with Dr. Werner Vinge, retired San Diego State University professor of mathematics. He is better known as a Hugo Award-winning science fiction author. His works include True Names, Fast Times at Fairmont High, and Rainbow's End. Most importantly, his 1993 essay, The Coming Technological Singularity, argues that accelerating technological change will bring about the end of the human era as we know it, and that the world becomes so complex and foreign to human observers, it will be impossible to predict what will happen next. I've always been intrigued by science fiction's contributions to our thinking about the future. I am further intrigued by the idea of the singularity. If dramatic, technologically determined events could shape our futures, what is the impact on human society? And what, if anything, should schools be doing today to prepare kids for futures that we cannot possibly imagine? Hello, Werner. Thanks for joining. Hi. Let's take a moment to look at where we are today. At the beginning of the 1980s, we were the first to define the cyberpunk genre, particularly the story True Names. How much of that imagined world do you believe is reflected in today's society? Or in other words, are we now living in a cyberpunk world? Um, I think that uh, with, with uh, one or two technological um, features uh, absent, uh, that, the, that the technological situation we have now is very similar to the one that was described in, um, in, in True Names, which, which actually uh, was implicitly targeted, I believe, at the year 2014. Um, so there's, there's some things, for instance, the, the true nature of the mailman um, and the actual interface that people used when they were on the net uh, that, uh, as far as we know, have not, uh, have not come true. But the, the technological issues for the rest, I think, it worked out, uh, uh, luckily, for, for the writer, uh, well. I think that the there were aspects of what has come to be called or what is called cy- cyberpunk that um, are not really so uh, prominent as they were in many cyberpunk stories, and and that is uh, 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 corporate dominance of of uh, government. I don't think is any greater than it was in the 1980s. Uh, so that that was a trend that uh, I don't I don't see was. Uh, uh, one that went to a uh, m- much greater degree than one was already present back then. Right, but do you see, I mean, do we see some of this stuff uh, reflected in today's education world? Uh, access to the internet or cyberspace is strictly regulated. Uh, many kids use psychostimulants like Ritalin or Adderall. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, 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 of course, am not familiar with how uh, uh, access to the internet is regulated at schools. I don't think that is significant as far as the growing up experience goes, though, since access to the Internet overall, um, even in countries that des- desire to put a lot of restrictions on it, is, is uh, uh, more wide open than, than most uh, intellectual venues in the historical past. Right. Is the present, do you think, as dystopian as what you had envisioned, or is it really transformed as something different? The, um, the, the background in um, True Names was not super dystopian. There was, it, the, the political presence of the government was about the same as in, uh, in 1980. Uh, and it, it actually was mo- moderately economically depressed. Uh, I, again, just a, a lucky guess. Um, but other, other, dysto- other s- s- uh, stories that are associated with it term uh, cyberpunk or distinctly more dystopian, uh, for instance, Blade Runner, the movie, uh, it kind of reflects a lot of that. Um, and actually, I, I don't think those elements are, are extraordinarily present nowadays, or if they are present, they, they are in an amazing mix with other things that are very hopeful. And it's as if... Uh, the coin is still flipping through the air, and we don't know how it's going to come down. You know, and before before the year 1984, uh, people generally looked at computers um, the way George Orwell did in his novel 1984. 
uh, after 1984, people had these great visions of uh, computers uh, freeing uh, the people from uh, tyrannies. And uh, that is still a real possibility, and, and, and it's a real possibility that has come true in large parts of the world. But I would say the jury is still out as to whether the ultimate uh, um, effectiveness of uh, computers and communication automation uh, favors, uh, favors tyranny or favors uh, liberty. I, I'm putting my bets on liberty, but uh, I, I would say it's, it's not an obvious win in either direction. Right. You bring back memories of the 1984 Apple Super Bowl commercial. So right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, th yeah, I think that was a cultural change point. So. Right. But yeah, I suppose let's talk about computers and accelerating change a bit. Now that's 2012, uh, what's your 2012 definition of the technological singularity? And when do you think we might expect it? Um. On that, I'm, I'm still where I was in my 1993 essay that I, that I gave at a NASA meeting, and that is that uh, I, I, defined, I defined the technological singularity as to be the, um, the development, through, our, our developing through technology, uh, superhuman intelligence, um, or becoming ourselves superhumanly intelligent through technology. And I think calling that the singularity is actually a very good term um, uh, in, in the sense of, of vast and unknowable change, a different, a qualitatively different sort of change than uh, technological progress in the past. For instance, you could explain um, inventions and the impact of inventions, such as the printing press, to somebody before the invention, you know, if somehow magically you could talk to them. Uh, they might not believe you as to the consequences, but they could understand what your claims were. And if, you're, if, on the other hand, you're talking about, about increasing the intelligence and the creativity of the top players, which is, in, in, in our entire history, has been humanity and humans, uh, if you're talking about improving that, then you're really not in a position of being able to explain it to somebody from, from, from our era, any more than we could explain you know, what we're doing to, to a goldfish or a chimpanzee. As to the time that uh, uh, the timeline for this, that also I'm uh, I pretty much the same as before. Uh, a, a, a large enough disaster could derail this, like a nuclear war. Uh, on the other hand, in the absence of a disaster, I think if the singularity can happen technologically, that it will happen, and I'd be surprised if it hasn't happened by uh, uh, 2030. Outstanding. You know, at that uh, NASA symposium, you presented four pathways to singularity. The first, that computers would awaken and become intelligent. The second, that computer networks wake up as a super intelligent entity. Uh, the third is that the boundaries between humans and machines blur and enhance their intelligence. Or possibly a fourth way, they find ways through biology to improve the human mind. Now that's nearly 20 years later, do you see any of these emerging as a most likely candidate? Or perhaps new pathways are emerging? Ah, um... Well, first, first of all, you, that was a, 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 good, a good statement of the list, except the second one about networks. I think, I think what I said, and certainly what I still believe, is that uh, the combination of networks plus people all right. uh, becomes superhumanly intelligent. Uh, I, I would add something to that bulleted list. It was, it was something I mentioned back then, but it was, just, it was just kind of an afterthought in a later part of the essay. But I think it definitely should be graduated to being one of the one of these top ways and and that is that the 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 networked sum of all the embedded microprocessors and all our devices becomes a kind of digital gaia um that qualifies as a, as, as an ensemble qualifies as a superhuman entity um that that is that is probably the weirdest of all the possibilities because if it looks like anything, it looks like animism. Uh, and I sometimes point to it when I when I when I want to make the issue that this could be very strange. I think actually the uh, the net networking of embedded microprocessors is going like gangbusters. Uh, the the network that is the internet plus humanity um, that is also 
going extraordinary with extraordinary surprises if you, if you just look at the successes in in um, the, the various schemes that go by names like crowdsourcing. Right. Those are those have been to me at least those have been uh, uh, astounding and uh, uh, give some real should give people real pause about how, how to use uh, the uh, uh, the intellectual resources actually that we have out there. Uh, uh, we so far we don't have a single computer that really is of, of human level intelligence, uh, and uh, I think that's going to happen. But it's kind of an amazing thing that we have an installed base of seven billion of these devices out there, <laughs> and uh, that's an it, it, and it is just beginning to be uh, the, the power of that of that group is just beginning to be realized now that they can really talk to one another and collaborate and, and, and have, and have uh, computers to help them with uh, that collaboration. Right. And this, um, this sort of human technology integration is, is just uh, really fascinates me, but on the human side, um, I, I'm wondering if people are starting to experience their own soft singularities rather than experiencing one master's singularity narrative, different people or organizations or even countries are experiencing their own singularity like phenomena. In other words, people are hitting a point where the world is changing around them so rapidly that they cannot cognitively envision what could happen next. What's your take on the sort of emerging social expressions of hitting the wall of our imaginations? And I'm really thinking of like government leaders and like vision, uh, social right. career, a school career guidance counselors working from 20 year old career guides, the Tea right. Party, these sort of uh, emergences, people just really hitting the limits of their imagination. I gave a, a talk a couple of weeks ago up at Singularity University, and the, I think the title of the talk was Gr Group Minds. And that's probably a better way to look at this. Uh, uh, internet uh, networks plus people than crowd than the term crowdsourcing. That uh, in fact, uh, this particular path toward the singularity uh, is, is to me probably the most optimistic uh, because the vast majority of people um, they ha they have their personal interests, they have their personal sorts of talents. And, and overall, uh, I, I, I think they are um, good-hearted. Uh, and the idea of, they, of those people uh, and the way they can interact with reality becoming so much more empowered is, is extraordinarily uh, uh, optimistic. I, I think if you look at the 20th century, have you ever heard of the Flynn effect? The which, what effect? The Flynn effect. No, I haven't. Um, this might this might this might be cited as a, as the reason why IQ tests are flawed, uh, but the the Flynn effect is basically that there was a substantial improvement in uh, performance on IQ tests in the 20th century. And really spectacular. If you t if you took say a 12 year old in 1999 and ran them off against a 12 year old in in 1912, right? That the 12 year olds in 1999 would have whipped. On a, on, a, on, a, on a test that everybody agreed on, I don't know what, whether it would be the, uh, the classic uh, test that came out of World War I or not, but the, the, the classic test that, that the, the humans in the late 20th would have do a lot better. So that improvement is called the Flynn effect. And my explanation for it is simply that in the 20th century, um, uh, the rewards for, for the types of skills so that are you know, matched by doing well on a 20th century IQ test um, uh, be became much greater than before. In other words, what you did with your head in the 20th century for most people was much more important career-wise and being able to have a good life than it was in the uh, 1800s or the 1700s. And this isn't this isn't a Darwinian, uh, you know, evolution, uh, biological evolution issue. It just is a is a tribute to the plasticity of of the human uh, mind. That if we if we have a situation where we have to ha have to deal with problems and think about problems in a different way than we did before, we're very good at adopting new cognitive styles. 
Uh, that's my explanation for the Flynn effect. Um, what I think we're seeing now is really an accentuation of that, that automation is getting better and better and better. The, uh, the other bullet points on that list that uh, you quoted, um, and, and the issue of technological employment is scarier and scarier and scarier. Uh, the, what the effect this has, I think, is that it means that people who want to do well in this environment um, have to think about the sorts of things that they win at, that they're especially good at. And across the whole scheme, range of humanity, there's quite a, r a range of different intellectual things that people are good at. Many of them are not things that most of us formally regard as intellectual, but, but nevertheless they are. At the same time, um, the general range of things that we are good at has to be compared to what we're competing against. There are certain things that machines are good at that that range is is, is getting wider and wider. But in the meantime, uh, I, I think we see a situation where there are these certain things that the machines can't do yet, and we are very good at doing. And so this causes, I think, a lot of the stress in modern life. For instance, the, the fact that um, uh, more and more, I think, we get into situations where um, there are certain things about a task that a human has to do, but they are separate. They are separated by vast, <laughs> vast emptiness where automation works just fine now. And so, where in the old days you would have something where a human had to trudge through all that intermediate terrain and take care of it all, now there are just these bright high points where human attention is really absolutely still required. And so that means that you get job situations where you're kind of bouncing around between uh, spending a short amount of time on one thing and a short amount of time on another. Now, there's bad things about, about that sort of style, but I think it often shows up. And I, so I have this sort of vision of where the human workplace is scattered both in space and, and, and in time. And for a single career, it's not merely a matter of changing your career every couple of years. It's a matter of actually changing your point of attention on smaller time scales. So with these, these changing orientations towards work, the nature of work, um, and just massive uncertainties on the horizon, how do you think this looming singularity should be interpreted by schools? Well, I think that uh, you know, talking about the, the post-singularity situation is, is really not an accessible thing. Uh, talking about the run-up to the singularity makes a lot of sense for several different reasons. One is we have to, you know, get through it. The other thing, other is that it's our opportunity as as the as the chief players. It's our opportunity uh, to make things turn out uh, 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 safely and 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 happily. Um, in the meantime, at the at the just the level of uh, you know getting one's job uh, done. Um, I think there are real changes that are, that are going to be happening uh, in education and 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 more broadly in in, in training issues. Um, I think one thing that is is going to become more and more evident is the fact that we have seven billion uh, people out there who uh, are variously good, very good at different things, and. There are ways of, of amplifying and enhancing that by collaboration. And when I say collaboration, which we've, I think we've always thought was a, a very, uh, at, at least as it's used in normal social conversation, is, is, a very good, is a very good thing. But if you look at some of the group mind projects and the, and the crowdsourcing projects, um, there is very great imagination that can be exercised in in making collaboration effective. One thing that it, it is to I interface people who have very uh, different uh, uh, skills. Um, that can actually be helped a lot by, uh, you know, by the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the network. Uh, it can even be done in a more fine-grained way where, for instance, you, could, you can actually split tasks, I, I believe. You can split tasks up along different dimensions than you could before, where it isn't one group does one thing and talks to another group. It's where 
one group was does one type of, of cognitive processing on a certain sort of problem, and then that's pipelined through as results uh, to another group. I suspect that just looking through a list of, of uh, group projects, uh, you know, Fold it and the and the equivalent project for for RNA, the Galaxy uh, cataloging project. Uh, there's dozens and dozens of them out there. Uh, oh, Duolingo and, and Recaptcha are two, are two of the most extraordinary ones to look at. That there's all sorts of inspiration there, not just not not just for uh, uh, education, but for things like uh, commercial models for doing things that are intellectual. Duolingo, for instance, is a project for teaching foreign languages to non-speakers, and it's most the, the two the two largest components are the computer component and um, people who don't know the language they're trying to learn. It is sort of a, a, a it is sort of a miracle that that combination actually could do something that would produce a system for uh, teaching a foreign language. Right. And in your story, Fast Times at Fairmont High, you wrote about a group of students working in collaborative work uh, who were worried about an exam. In a world with ubiquitous computing and augmented reality technologies that make access to and perhaps even analysis of information readily available, what do you think students should be learning and how? Or are we really looking at more of, more of a focus on skills development? Uh, in Fast Times at Fair Fairmont High, I made a uh, I, I made a big deal of uh, uh, the, the teachers figuring the important thing was uh, uh, teaching the children how to learn how to learn, you know, how, how to come onto a situation and, and uh, uh, absorb what they needed to absorb in, or, in order to be able to uh, uh, handle the project. Um, I, I, I still um, think that I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of things where we may find that um, uh, we're going to be in a situation where things that we spent an, an enormous amount of time and money in earlier um, decades are 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 going to happen much much uh, uh, faster. So um, economic improvements, that is, price decreases on the order of ten to a hundred times. I think are really feasible. I'm I, I'm a big fan of the Khan Academy, and I think there are other things, including customizing um, customizing the teaching regime to the you know the, the uh, peculiarities of the individual student. Um, the most important thing might might be actually uh, shifting the emphasis from um, intense uh, attention. To process and having the process of the teaching right, shifting that attention to uh, ha having independent rating agencies that are not so much interested in process as they are interested in, in giving um, reliable uh, rating information to the people who have to uh, judge the results of the money that is being spent on the education. This also includes, of course, the, the students coming out of this pipeline and their judgment of how of how well uh, whatever is, whatever process was used for them, how well it is working uh, for them in their post-graduation years. Very interesting. And you've also been hinting, and this also ties in your, your earlier uh, comments, that because nature of work is changing, that people are going to need to find ways to retrain more. And in Rainbow's End, you explore what happens when university professors retrain themselves for new careers at a typical high school. But there seems to be a real attitude in America that once when you're done with school, you're done. And that being credentialed in itself means that you're ready for a career. But with the extinction of real careers, does it make sense to credential anybody anymore if the knowledge or the career that you trained for is perhaps obsolete by the time that you graduate? Uh, I think rather, rather this may reflect a, a weakness in, in the particular credentialing agencies. In other words, uh, what is it that you are being um, rated uh, for? If you're being rated for something like your ability to program in Java, that's that's one thing, and and that has all the static problems that uh, you know that I think you were re referring to. Uh, on the other hand, having where the, where the rating is talking about some 
broader set of abilities, for instance, math uh, or language, that's, that's a little bit more plausible that we could, could have ratings. There also might be the thing that, uh, um, that rating for particular abilities that are, that are probably only going to be needed for a short amount of time, that that will still go on, but that uh, uh, it will be much more, much more faster paced uh, and that uh, uh, one's a, a ability with certain sorts of, of uh, group methods of interaction will actually be something that can be rated. Interesting. So, change the subject just slightly. Um, schools of today really look and operate no differently than they did centuries ago. Uh, in a world consumed by accelerating change, does the future need schools? Ah, I think that the, that the uh, notion of uh, getting young people um, what they need intellectually. Uh, you know, to to live, that that's going to that's going to remain very important. The physical presence of schools uh, much less important, and and then the the real question is, what does the school actually do? And uh, I think that you know, you and I probably have a lot of agreement about what the you know the sort of general landscape that we're moving into is. Uh, and I suspect that's what a, a lot of people would a, a, agree on. Um, what is not agreed upon, and which, and what I contend is not known, is what is the be- is the, is the uh, what is the best way to uh, a- attain that goal of of of, of preparing uh, young young people for for this uh, new situation. And I would say it's it's not known for for a couple reasons. One is we really don't know. I'm, I'm, Talking pre singularity here, sure. Still, uh, but, but it's not known because even pre singularity, with accelerating change, we really don't know exactly you know what's going to be uh, needed, except that it probably will involve a good deal of, of flexibility um, and ability with collaborations. So that's one sense in which it's not known. But the other sense is even if we knew exactly what the target was, uh, it's still not known what is what within very broad uncertainty. Bounds. It's it's not known what is the right way uh, uh, to prepare young people for this, and uh, that includes the fact that uh, the, the 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 different styles of learning that that students have are, are, are very different. So I think that uncertainty adds up to the fact that it's not enough that we all agree this is very 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 important. Maybe one of the two or three most important things about uh, you know uh, our our society. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's very important if we don't know. And that also means that uh, spending a lot of money on a unitary solution when you don't know is is almost certainly a, a, a terribly big mistake to make. So this is definitely, to my mind, a case where there ha- has to be the, the doors thrown open to an awful lot of experimentation that, that then is followed up uh, not by... You know, not not by unitary rating rules, but by, by rating systems that themselves are subject to uh, comp- competition. That is based on uh, what people, what the consumers of that rating rating information want to spend their money on. So you're suggesting moving from sort of a monoculture approach towards education, towards attending to an ecology of options, including the valuations of these of of these options as well. Right, and in fact, the 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 evaluation stage, just as you said, I mean, it is itself subject to this selection project process. But the evaluation stage is the place where the quality control is happening. That is the quality control on the whole system. At least in our lifetimes, what if the singularity doesn't happen? Ah, um, I think that's a very real possibility. Of course, the obvious way it wouldn't happen is, you know, we get some terrible disaster like a big nuclear war. So I'm not talking about, I take your question not to be that, but to be, you know, what if the singularity doesn't happen? Because, say, it, it can't happen that technologically we're the smart, smartest that uh, um, uh, can be, and, I, I, and or that we can't figure out how to make things that are smarter. I think that's a possibility. Um, and it's always wise to consider 
no matter what one's how one rates probabilities, it's it's good to consider the things that you don't think are likely. Um, I actually gave a a talk I'm proud of on that called "What If the Singularity Does Not Happen." Oh, it's it's probably probably the first hit on on Google if you were to look for that string. Um, and I think if 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 it doesn't if it doesn't happen, I could see a situation where large software projects do not continue to have large benefits, and so you get uh, a period of decades where we you know we try to do better and better, but we find that beyond a certain point, the projects are not are not you know coming together, and so that the 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 drive the economic drive that is making Moore's law uh, go forward and go forward uh, damps out. And so that we wind up in 2030 and 2040 with some with some awfully good consumer electronics and probably larger computer memories than anybody has ever uh, I- imagined, but that we do not figure out how to how to keep up with the data glut, and so that ultimately that levels out also. So one of the one of the positive or quasi positive things that shows up early on in such a, a scenario is. Uh, I don't know whether you've been involved with programmers or done programming yourself, but uh, you know mo- most software that's out there is really bad. Yeah, <laughs> bloated. Well, you can imagine that if 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 for some reason we were in a situation where the software, um, uh, you know, there was no prospects for better and better hardware. Uh, that we were in an equilibrium, that in that situation <laughs> there would be time to go back and do the software right. Um, and actually, I, I don't think that would really, I don't think that would be nearly as attractive as it looks, but uh, I, I think for the first few decades after that was recognized, there would be this uh, sort of feeling of satisfaction that we were in this terrible rushed era and now we can, can, go, can go back and do it right. Meantime, as the centuries passed, um, the large memory that we were left with would be big enough to hold all the software had ever been written. And so you would be in a situation that happens quite often now, but would, would be ubiquitous in this, uh, in this uh, non-singularity future. And that would be a situation where if, you have a, if you're handed a project, your, fir- you, you, your choice is, do I want to write this project or I, do I want to go dumpster driving in my laptop? And find out that 300 years ago somebody did almost this, and that I can, uh, you know, I can modify my that program in in order to do this new project without having to do very much new programming. Run an emulator and tap into some abandoned ware. Right. So software archaeology uh, would become a very a very big deal. Not because anything was especially lost, but because nothing was lost. That's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard that term before. Software archaeology. Yeah, actually, most most terms like that. When I when I think of terms like that, I look around and say, "Oh yeah, people have been talking about for that for decades." I actually haven't heard too much about software archaeology. There is actually interest in what's called software reuse, right? And and the idea of being able and this is this is re, I can actually point you at acad, at an academician who's doing this. Um, the the dream would be to have a searchable database. Where you could get code snippets uh, for particular uh, for, for particular things, so sort of formalizing what I think happens a lot already. I want to say thank you, and uh, I guess I do have one final question, and that's to ask if there are any questions that you wished that I had asked. Uh, no, I think we're headed along with all, along with everybody else. We're headed for some very disruptive times, and I mean that in a constructive way, but it's nevertheless intimidating. All right, thank you very much for your time, Werner. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you. For more information on Berner's work, please visit educationfutures.com.